When the Buddha first described his path, he called it a middle way between two extremes, indulgence and sensual pleasures and self-affliction and pain. It's led a lot of people to think that the path is kind of a neutral mind state, not all that pleasant but not all that painful. That's not the case. An important part of the path is right concentration, and right concentration has some very intense pleasure and rapture. It was the Buddha's realization that sensual pleasure and pain were not the only alternatives, or as he said, that sensual pleasure was not the only escape from pain. There is an alternative. The pleasure that comes from what he calls form, your sense of the body as you feel it from the inside, as you're working with the breath. As you breathe in and out, notice the flow of energy, not only the flow of the air, but the flow of energy through the body. That allows the air to come in, go out. Notice where it seems to be flowing well and where it doesn't seem to be flowing well. And see if you can figure out a way to make it flow better. Part of that has to do with relaxing some of your muscles, maybe changing your posture a little bit so that things aren't blocked. Part of it has to do with your metal images of what's going on in the body. There may be some tight passages where you feel you're trying to force the breath through them, and that makes them even tighter. The breath doesn't respond very well to forcing. It responds to allowing. Allow the energy to flow. Then maybe those tight passages are simply passages of breath energy that are flowing in a different direction from where you think they should. Allow for that possibility, because maybe that's where they really should be flowing. Not where you think they should, but where they are. And the more you fight it, the worse it gets. So play around a little bit with your perceptions of the breath, too. And as you find yourself getting more and more interested in this flow of energy in the body, the mind begins to settle down. And there's a quality of ease that comes with that, when the mind has one place it can stay and doesn't have to go jumping around. It's like trying out different places to sleep, and none of them quite work, so you have to get up and move around. And that one doesn't work. This get up and move around. And this part of the mind that really doesn't want to settle in until it's found a place that it really likes. Well, try to make the breath a place that you really like. And then watch over it. The watching over it is important, because otherwise a sense of pleasure comes up. You go for the pleasure and you drop the breath. This can lead to what a John Fuhring or John Lee would call delusion concentration, where things are very still in the mind, it's already pleasant, but you're not really sure where you are or what you're focused on. Sometimes you can stay in that state for a while and come out and ask yourself if you really were awake or not. You weren't quite asleep, but you weren't even very clear either. That comes from dropping the breath and just going for the pleasure. Because another important aspect of the path, in addition to finding an alternative escape from pain through developing the pleasure of concentration, is to learn how to get the mind so it's not overcome by pleasure and not overcome by pain. This means that as you're watching the breath, and there are pains in the body, you learn to treat them with some equanimity, accepting the fact that there will be pains in different parts of the body. John Lee's images of a tree that has some old leaves and new leaves. The new leaves nourish the tree. The old leaves are going to ready to fall away. They're not much help. So you focus on the new leaves. Focus on the areas where it, it is pleasant, and accept it as a natural part of having a body. They're going to be physical pains. They're going to be potentials for pains. And what you do with them is going to make a big difference in their impact on the mind. If you focus on them and get all worked up about them, sometimes the pains can be very minor, but 
you can make them very upsetting. If you learn some skills and how to handle pain, you can be with strong pain and it's not going to have that much of an impact on the mind. All of this has to do with your intentions and your attention, how you pay attention to things. And your perception of this whole issue of potentials in the body. It's not like pains and pleasures are totally given. There's partly a potential that comes from your past karma, but there's also what you contribute right now. And the impact it's going to have on the mind is totally dependent on what you contribute. So we want to learn some skills in dealing with pleasures and pains, so that neither of them overwhelm the mind. So again, this means this pleasure begins to develop in the body. You stay with the breath. You don't leave the breath to go to the pleasure. And as the pleasure gets more intense, you want to make sure that your awareness fills the whole body. And you take that as your frame of reference. Because the breath at that point starts getting more and more refined. And if you're not careful, you can lose your bearings. Where there was breath, it seems to be more and more difficult to find. Well, if you take the whole body, whatever you sense in the body, as your frame of reference here, then even as the breath gets more subtle, you're not lost. You don't fall into those little air pockets that can happen when you're focused on a small spot of the body, and the breath suddenly seems to dis disappear. And the fact that you're trying to keep your awareness filling the body, it gives you work to do. Because this is an essential principle, that you are working with the pleasure. You're not just wallowing in it, you want to work with it. You want to understand what's causing it. The Buddha's observation is that the fact that you're alert to the breath is one of the causes for pleasure. If you keep that alertness continuous, the, the pleasure smooths out, and as it gets smooth, it gets more intense. It develops a kind of momentum and builds up. And whatever good it's going to do for the body, or good it's going to do for the mind, you don't have to go making exclamations about it to yourself. This is not like sensual pleasure. That's where you have to dress things up. You can spend a lot of money, say, for a meal in a restaurant. You have to anticipate how really great it's going to be and what great chefs they're going to have and how nice the atmosphere is going to be. And you make comments about it. Nowadays, people even take pictures of their meals and send them to friends. And then you think about it afterwards. And our habit is the more we make a big deal out of something, the greater satisfaction we get from it. Because when you look at eating, and there's a lot of eating, a lot of the aspects of eating are not all that attractive. You have to sit there and chew and chew and chew and swallow. Sometimes, sometimes you swallow and you didn't chew it properly and it goes down the wrong way, or it doesn't, it gets stuck someplace. You think of all the work that goes into getting the food, the work that goes into earning the money to buy the food. And the more you think about it, the more miserable it is. It's that little bit of flavor and that sense of fullness that comes, the nourishment that comes. That's what makes it worthwhile. But if that's all we have, then why do we have to spend so much money on getting fancy food or special food or dressing it up this way, dressing it up that way? Sensual pleasures require a lot of elaboration to make them seem worthwhile. Where's the pleasure from concentration? Even though you have to work for a while to get to that you really appreciate it, you begin to realize that the pleasure itself doesn't require a lot of elaboration. The good it's going to do for the mind is just there. Whether you're exclaiming to yourself about it or not, it soothes the mind, it soothes the body. It's good for you. Which means that your attitude should be more, okay, you do the work and the pleasure will take care of itself. And then it becomes more of a question of 
how do you make sure that this sense of ease gets translated into the rest of your life so it's not just something you experience while you're sitting here? If you don't let yourself get overwhelmed by it, okay, you can start noticing. This is how you breathe. This is where you focus. This is how you think about the breath, how you picture the breath to yourself. You can carry that into other activities. You want to start out with simple things like walking meditation and then with simple chores. Can you stay with the breath as you're working? So I'd say around the monastery. When we were building the jetty at Wat Tamasate, people were noticing that on the days when they were actually meditating, then they could sling a lot of buckets of cement and rake up a lot of gravel to go into the cement and do all the other pretty heavy physical chores that were required. And they didn't lose energy. The energy stayed up. The breath was helping them. It was their cushion as they worked. It was their nourishment as they worked. If they forgot about the breath, they'd work for about an hour and they're totally worn out. So once you have a sense of pleasure that comes from the concentration, don't just let it sit there. And you want to see if you can carry it into other activities. Otherwise you become a, a sitting junkie. All you can think about is you want to sit, 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 and meditate. But as human beings, we have work we have to do. And to get the most out of the pleasure, you want to learn how to regard it as a skill and focus on mastering the skill. Get some satisfaction in mastering the skill as you carry the sense of being centered, having a soothing, healthy breath energy into lots of different activities. As you get better and better, you can get, take it into activities that otherwise would have you upset or have you worked up, afraid. You realize you can breathe through that, and the fact that the breath is comfortable gives you a sense of well-being, a sense of belonging there that you wouldn't have otherwise. This is one of the ways in which concentration practice teaches you how not to be overwhelmed by pleasure. In other words, you learn how to work with it so it becomes something more and more ordinary and something you know that it will do its work for you in terms of soothing the body, soothing the mind, nourishing the body, nourishing the mind, whether you wallow it in or not. In fact, it's going to do a better job of helping you when you don't wallow. So you can take both pleasure and pain in your stride. And that skill is what helps free the mind from a lot of its concerns. If you can find your pleasure only in certain places and only certain postures, you're going to be stuck on those places and postures. And you don't want to be distracted from wallowing in the pleasure so that any other activities would are irritating. That's not helpful. The attitude should be, here I am producing it, and as I produce it, it's going to do its work. And if it's not doing its work in certain parts of the body, it's simply a sign that you haven't learned how to spread the breath energy to those parts. So you're doing work that requires thought. Okay, let it spread around behind the eyes, around the eyes, deep into the brain. If you're doing heavy physical work and you found that you've hurt yourself, okay, figure out some way to focus on the breath and use the breath energy that it can heal that. Now sometimes that will require focusing directly on the more painful spot and thinking of the breath permeating it, not pushing it through, but allow it to slip through easily. Think of all the space between the atoms, even in tight parts of the body. See if you can think of the breath going through that effortlessly. Other times it will require not focusing on that part, focusing on some other part in the body. This is something you have to experiment with. But again, it comes from approaching pleasure as a skill. 
getting clearer and clearer about cause and effect. And that's how you find out what the Buddha meant by the middle way between indulgence and pleasure and sensual pleasure and indulgence and pain or indulgence and self-torture. On the one hand, you've got this alternative form of pleasure. And two, you learn how to work with pleasure and pain without indulging. It's there, you make the most of it, but there's this part of the mind that's not allowing itself to get overwhelmed. That's what's special about the path, and that's how you learn how to master it.